like a two minute history of how you got into the vineyard. We've got that one down. Well, actually, we just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And uh, we bought this fa a farm, a small farm, 27 acre orchard, the old Olmstead place back in 1959. And, um, and it was, uh, we had orchards, we had uh, some sweet cherries, some prunes, some hazelnuts, and I was not a serious farmer. In fact, I knew very little about it, but anyhow. So, um, so what brought you to, what, what made you buy the property then? Uh, actually, uh, I graduated in 1948 from University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh -huh. a business school, and uh, then, uh, between that time when we came out to Portland initially uh, and 1959, we had lived in eight cities in 11 years, and we raised, moved five kids. <laughs> wow. All those times, 11 years. So what it, between my job and between um, the military, I was called back into the Navy as a naval officer during the Korean War. So uh, we lived, starting out, leaving Wisconsin in 1948, Lowy uh, uh, also graduated actually from Milwaukee State Teachers, which now is UW-Milwaukee. And uh, so we arrived, we didn't know anybody out here. But we just, we had a lot of friends back there and a lot of relatives. And we but just, what was the call then? I mean, what... I mean, we loved, we, we had read all about the Pacific Northwest. Uh -huh. this and is about Portland. the beaches and the mountains. Yeah. And, and, I, and the forest and, and just, uh, just growing up in Wisconsin, we're right on Lake Michigan. I, I knew I needed to be near some water. Mm -hmm. Lloyd grew up in Milwaukee. So we just decided we were going to move to Oregon. And she got a teaching job in uh, Portland, and then I... That, that was your wife? Yeah, Lloyd. Lloyd? Yeah, L-O-I-E. L-O-I-E? Yeah. Oh, okay. Everybody refers to her as Lloyd. Oh, okay. So anyhow, uh, so then between the 1948, we then lived in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Sacramento, Reno, Lake Tahoe, area. Wow. <laughs> Back to Portland. <laughs> like two years at a time. And then at that point, we said, you know, we moved these kids 11 times. Five kids. It's five wow. kids, I mean, in 11 years. So anyhow, we moved the kids five times, so we said, hey, it's time for us to take rent. So we, we thought we were going to buy, a, we wanted to buy a view lot in the country, and the, but the lady, the widow of this old established uh, farm, orchard, uh, it was a 19, that home was built in 1916. The home that you live in? Yeah. And it was a typical, these people came out from Iowa, and, uh, and, and so it was a uh, typical Midwestern classic, full basement type. It was just a, it's a lovely home. Uh-huh. So we decided uh, that, okay, we'll, we'll buy the, the whole nine yards, okay? <laughs> so the home and acreage. Yeah, 27 acres. I, and there were, I had three tractors. I had never driven a tractor in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in fact, some, I guess somebody told me, and I reminded me that, I didn't even know how to start the thing. And I, a couple I, old tracks, too. I had to call somebody up to tell me how to start this, this crawler tractor. But anyhow. So th then uh, we, we uh, and then I had the opportunity to move elsewhere. But I, I, I decided this is, we decided this is going to be where we're going to say. It was kind of a career changing uh, event. <laughs> <laughs> so what year was that when you? Uh, that was in uh, 1959 when we finally decided, hey, that's it. Uh -huh. We're here. And because uh, I spent, I had to go back to the Navy for a couple of years and as a naval officer. Uh, <clears throat> So anyhow, so what happened is uh, we then found ourselves surrounded by farmers who wanted to retire. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then we began buying some additional acreage. Uh, and and then, what was the thought? I mean, like, why buy? I mean, you're, you're, well, now you've learned how to drive a tractor. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why. Having lived in L.A., in the Bay Area, we lived on the peninsula. Uh-huh. 
And then Sacramento and Reno, we saw how what was happening down there in terms of real estate. Uh-huh. And when we arrived in Oregon, it, I mean, we Frank, we didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of kids, and that's why we didn't have a lot of money. But they had a lot of free labor. <laughs> so what happened is we um, I, we could buy, Lloyd and I could buy, and I gotta remember always to say we. Right. Lloyd and I could buy you always any do. orchard for three, four hundred bucks an acre. All view property. Adjoining the farm here. All view property. And so you wanted to become a speculator then? Developer? Well, well oh no, not no, a developer. No, no. no. What, what do we want into new farming? Uh huh. And, and hopefully I'd be able to continue my job. Lloyd, then after raising the five kids, went back to teaching, but Full first time. the kids were raised. And then, uh, uh, and then we, we weren't speculating on it, but we knew that that we could we could gamble and leverage ourselves uh-huh. because the property would only become more valuable. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay? yeah. And we we felt that there might be enough cash flow off the place to handle. And and I I would uh, I, I basically didn't go to the banks to borrow money. I'd make a deal with the person who owned the land, and, and I'd give him a contract and pay him a good rate of interest, and and meet the payments, and, and then he could retire it enough in in in. Case of this this farm, fifty three acres or whatever it was, uh, Joe Herring could live there in that house as long as he wanted to, rent free. So we didn't change his lifestyle. So so we started out with twenty seven, then we bought another fifty three. That's the and in effect the farm. we acquired a, a number thirty acres uh, that we added to the farm, and then we bought another right. twenty one acres. So I think we eventually had about one hundred and sixty acres up here. Wow. Mostly in orchard and then also in forest. Uh-huh. At that point, but we had two full-time mechanics, tractor mm-hmm. drivers, and this type of thing. Uh-huh. And um, so then, um, then in 1958, I think it was, Dick Erath came up my driveway. 68. And he had this. Yeah, 68. 68. Oh, yeah, excuse me, that's, that's right. 1968. Right. He had this old beat-up BMW. And he had this big old beard. <laughs> yeah, he did. And Keena was with him. And, and, and that was when, frankly, that when we came out here in 59, the road ended at, at my mailbox. Oh, really? There we had no a neighbors. Dirt, just a dirt road leading up Warden Hill Road, which which we called Warden Hill Road because it wasn't even... Yeah. And and uh-huh. and it, it, it led up to uh, uh, the old Allen Fruit Company. Right. Uh, uh, ranch, which they had sour cherries up there. And those cherries used to go down to Newburgh, and they were bright. That's that's that became Allen Machinery when they got it. But their initial wow. start was in agriculture. Allen Fruit Company. Huh. In and Kenny Allen was the son, and right. he had, didn't want anything to do apparently with farming. So they they kind of that thing was kind of abandoned. It wasn't really maintained anymore. Uh-huh. And that's why basically land was so cheap up here. I mean, bare land you could probably pay two hundred bucks an acre. Wow. Yeah. So we acquired as much as we could. Yeah. But then, when we got involved in the grape scene, because of... Let's the, t- finish the story about when uh, Dick oh, Dickie Dickie came up uh, drove up in his old... Got that or Dick Dick and and he had all this, this sheaf of paper underneath his arm and, and knocked on the front door. And, 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 you know, we didn't have that many visitors then because uh, we were at the end of the road. And, uh, and he introduced himself, still living, I think, in uh, California then, Oakland. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know... Um, I'm Dick Erath. I've looked all over the West Coast for a great viticulture site, and I think you're sitting on it. Do you want to try something new? And I said, <laughs> I was kind of desperate because people sell, tell me, I, well, no, Jim, you got into this out of the romance of the grape. I said, no, mm-hmm. sheer desperation. I was sitting on several hundred tons of unsold prunes. Oh, and it was I all tell prunes people up here. who come in the tasty room, I said, you think, if you think you've had a business problem, <laughs> think of me said you've got 200 tons of unsold prunes, like, and wow. when's the last time you've eaten a prune, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there's no romance to so, going through. No, <laughs> right. So therefore, you say, you know what, most everybody else is motivated about the romance of the grape and all this sort of stuff, make, make the organs best, you know, I just... I just was looking for a better cash crop. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did he convince you that this was 
going to be a cash crop because not many people were growing grapes here. Well, I figured anything no would be better than really. forty dollar a ton prunes. That's what the price of prunes got up wow. to. And we weren't. We still maintained our orchards, but I said, "Okay, Dick, I tell you what, we're always willing to try something new." And <clears throat> in fact, in his book, he points out that we were one of the few people that really uh, gambled. To be willing to. But we also had the rest of our orchards. But So I said, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll plant an acre and a half of Riesling and then an acre of uh, Pinot Noir. Uh-huh. And uh, we'll pull the, the prunes out of there. And then, uh, but I said, I'm going to need a lot of help, honestly, because I, I don't know how to grow wine grapes. I know how to, how to grow good fruit. And uh, so he assured me that he had all this knowledge and this type of thing. And uh, and then remind me later on to tell a story about, about the, his 25th the, crush when he acknowledged he didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> but anyhow, so what happened is we uh, we were uh, we, we we were engaged in a conversation, and I said, "Okay, you convinced me. What do we need?" He said, "Well, you, you need to build a greenhouse. Like I need to build a greenhouse." <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know about that part. Yeah, so okay. <laughs> Uh, I tell you what we'll do. Uh, it, it can't be very big. It, it, that's still standing. It's, it's You've parked in that. Oh, is that right? That's the original it has, greenhouse. It has, it, it has a D2 tractor in mint condition. But that was that, a greenhouse. Wow. So what happened is, uh, and we had, you know, we, my guys built it, and we had Kevin the from- uh, the plastic, you know. We, we couldn't even afford glass. We had the, the plastic, and then we had... Uh, Kina, right, helping that's Dick's and Nick would come down, and my yeah. two guys, Fern and Ted, would come down, and and uh, Loy, and uh, and and it's we did and all everything. the work. And I said, okay, but how about the cuttings? He said, and that's when it was difficult to get wood. Well, there was no wood in Oregon, of course. So Dick said, I'll get the cuttings from Wendy in mm-hmm. California, mm-hmm. which he did. So he brought the cuttings in, and then uh, we actually. Uh, so I think in 1968 we built that greenhouse and we propagated the plants. That had to be. And then in uh, in in or 69 was the indica vine behind the red house. 69. Yeah, oh, was yeah. when the, when we put the first indicator vine and then Ted did his little gardening trick with it. Oh, well, you got to hear that too. Yeah. Because Dick said, "Well, how do we know we couldn't actually write them here?" Dick said, well, we'll put an indicator vine out there behind Ted's house, the little red house. Uh-huh. We're Ted and looking. then we'll watch it and we'll observe what, you know, what it, the buds <laughs> and all this type of thing. Uh, well, uh, one, the only time I, I, I saw Dick Erath mad, he came up my drive and said, Jim, what happened to that indicator vine? I said, oh, it's still there. And Dick said, no, Ted dissed it up. <laughs> Did the tractor work right on over? What is this wild thing growing? <laughs> Later on, I heard he went back to Kena and he said, These GD Oregon farmers <laughs> 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 oh, oh, But it didn't make a difference. The vineyard started uh, going in anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, but then I had the other catch. And that was I had to go to the bank yeah. to borrow some money. To build that greenhouse. I was, <laughs> I was borrowing a lot of money for, for my 160 acre operation. You know, yeah. A lot of money. And I would always have my budget with these line items. Uh huh. And I put that one item in there, hoping he wouldn't see it, and it said greenhouse. <laughs> and he said, Jim, greenhouse, what is this all about? I thought, oh, God, he found it. He <laughs> <laughs> has an accountant, so he knows <laughs> how to do this. I, I, I had a you know, accounting background, but anyhow, yeah, business was, background. Yeah. So uh, what happened is I said, uh, well, uh, we're going to grow wine grapes in Oregon. He, said, <laughs> he, he looked at me and said, you can't grow wine grapes in Oregon. I knew he was not going to fund fu- me anymore. Okay. So I said, okay, let's take that out of there. Okay. You're going to give me the rest of the money. So oh, sure. So I left. He gave me the money. And he said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll lend you this X number of dollars. So I got back to Ira. Ira is kind of waiting to see whether I got the money. Mm-hmm. I said, I did, but from now on, we're going to call it, because I took it out of my diesel budget, the diesel greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's the diesel shed. <laughs> oh, man. 
<laughs> so anyhow, then it's still there. So now. It came I, I take care of it. And, you know, to plant the vineyard. Okay, of course, I still don't irrigate. But anyhow, none of us. Uh, so we had to figure out uh, because we have the dry summers, so how we're going to keep these things going. So what we did, and, and Dick figured this out, uh, we'd auger the hole, and then we'd get these milk cartons, the half-gallon half, half gallon milk cartons. Uh -huh. Like very gold and all. And, and they're open on both ends. And then we would pop those down into the hole, and then we would put the plant down and, and backfill around the plant. And then to water about every three weeks, we would take a tractor and a tanker. Oh, wow. The so rest of when you've seen them on the little, farm. Little greenhouse plant. Uh -huh. And we one year, and then we took the cup, and then we, we dry farm, so we, we mulch. We, we don't use any herbicides, any pesticides, and we, we, we it's 100% free. Clean and we have about eight, seven feet of clay loam, eight feet of clay loam, about eight feet of fractured rock, then we have basalt. So if you manage these soils properly, we get about 35 inches of rainfall a year here. The grape plant needs 24. So all these farmers that I observed, it, see that's, I had zero knowledge, but I watched these guys farm. I watched how they maintain the moisture in, in these jury soils. The old ones. I can't say this will work in Woodburn or Willow Kenzie soils, but they, it sure works because this is what I observed from guys like uh, Joe Herring and Amo Sander and the Holtz Myers and all right. these old farmers who taught us how to farm these soils. And the same principles of fruit growing uh, also applied to grape growing. Uh, so as a result, then we put out our first vineyard in 1970, and then our first crush. I think Dick either had some in, two, in 73 or 73. 73, 73, 73 uh, very first one. And it was in his basement. Of the house. And he had, he had this uh -huh. little stemmer crusher that we were turning by hand, and then he had that little basket press that we were turning by hand. Yep, the wooden one. And as I was, we were jumping from our cherry boxes, right. the grapes, into this thing, I said to Dick, are you sure this is going to work? <laughs> 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 My bankers, <laughs> it, sure, it won't work. So, I guess it's going to work okay, great. But anyhow, so then, uh, and then despite, you know, the, the lack of knowledge that we really had about this. We, oh yeah, we got general viticulture by there out of California. We Hard read cover. That. But then, <laughs> then we had to adopt that to California, Oregon conditions, which is completely different. We went to the old 12 foot by 6 foot spacing, which I still like. Mm -hmm. Well, I had big equipment, and I had, because I had big, a lot of orchards, and, I, and uh, nobody even thought about high density planting then. And, uh, right, it was a wide rose. So as a result, uh, the first wine was very, I mean, it wasn't really great, but it Young showed vines, the potential, very good. despite maybe <laughs> some, of the, some, of the, some of the mistakes that we might have made. And that's how, and then other people began to what, notice what we were doing. And then I watched the industry gradually uh, evolve. From guys, the pioneers like Lett and Soko Blosser and Ponzi, and who am I missing? Well, then Redford came in. They came in later. later. But I know. There were only five of us initially. It was basically Ponzi. Um, and Adelsheim later was that later, there too, yeah. yeah. So those people, are the five. Yeah, Chuck Court. Yeah. So there were only about the five The force growth. And, uh, but then, that was the first wave who, who basically would have either failed or succeeded. Or maybe not even did really well, but showed the potential of yeah. growing Oregon Pinot. So that's that's what happened. And then the next wave came in. The yeah, next five yeah, people, people. They weren't farmers. This is the one thing I, I, that I, was, I had a, a lot of my friends, cherry orchards. God, they were great Oregon farmers. I could not talk a single one of them into converting their cherry orchards into wine. Yeah, it's and not I right. I don't know why, because they would have really accelerated. The, uh, the quality, mm -hmm. because they knew how to farm these soils. And so it took guys like Adelstein, all these bright guys who got involved in this thing, and mm -hmm. Ponzi, to really uh, take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. To start the excitement. Then, then gradually we, they accumulated this, this body of information. And then when I think the big breakthrough was Domain Dry. When Domain Duran, Dave Lett had that tasting in Paris, 
mm-hmm. and came yeah, that in second tasting. or something like that. Then they had a retasting, and the same thing happened. And then, but that was the big, I remember one time, that was a the, the, uh, we had the very first barrel tasting at Domain Drive, and, and they invited uh, the, wine, some, the, the winemakers who were there, and a few uh, vineyard people like myself. Uh, I was standing next to Dickie Rith, and I was tasting this stuff right on their barrel. I said, God, this stuff is good, Dick. <laughs> could you do this? He said, if I had three million dollars, I could do it. <laughs> and that kind of told the story of the fact that, and that's why I, I tell people, I said, we were so blessed that to have uh, survived as long as we could until the next wave of people w- with not only knowledge, but also the capital to t- take the whole Oregon wine scene to the next level. Yeah, and that's the beauty of the fact that the whole industry is really held. It's mm-hmm. tight. It's all held together uh, because of that good relationship between the two groups. One group then didn't say, "Hey, get out of here, guys. We're in charge." Between the, the first wave and the second wave, and the third, right. and the third wave, yeah, and, and beyond, and uh-huh. beyond, yeah. and beyond. It's a collaboration and on now. And, on and, on. and every and and. And, and so we kind of draw from the knowledge of the facilities that they're mm-hmm. able to, to provide us with. And then they, these people will, will draw from us as to how we have been farming these things for almost 40 years now. So it, it's a good synergy, a good mix of, of uh, people. Yeah. And then the marketing too, the fact that they could do the marketing, which we never could have done. And plus the fact that, you know, really the guy is the first five, 10 or 15, of us were making a lot of money. Even if it had never taken off, we would have been happy making whatever, selling it maybe restaurants in Locally. Oregon and this having a little tasting room. Next, you know, winery and mm-hmm. none, of, none of these guys, all these guys promising to in other fields, okay? They could have done well in their other fields. But for all the other reasons, not... Which are? Well, uh, uh, just like the romance of the grape, the, the lifestyle, you know, creativity. creating this great pro- new product, you know, developing something that hadn't been tried before in a new gr- uh, 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 viticulture mm-hmm. district. And, and, and if, but th- their goal was not really profit oriented. At least mine wasn't, Dickie Rass wasn't, Let's wasn't, Alice, mm-hmm. at least I have to speak for themselves, but from what I observed. Um, if if the, if the whole thing had never taken off, then there just would have been ten or twenty or 50, thirty of us doing this for the rest of our lives. That would have been a great thing too. Yeah. So, but so anyhow, that's how the whole thing got uh, underway. I got to tell you the story about Dick's twenty fifth crush before I forget it. He had the celebration of his twenty fifth crush, and and right up his top of the house there, and there were about two hundred people there, and everybody's drinking all this great Oregon Pinot and. Dick and I are lying under a tree, and he said to me, you know, Jim, did you ever think it would be this big? And I said, no. He said, you know, back in 1970, we didn't know what we were doing. I said, wait a while. (laughs) Wait a while. You told me, right in front of your crusher, you knew what you were doing. Now, 25 years later, when I had pulled all my orchards and this type of thing, he said, no, he said... And these were his words. He said, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But I didn't know. So what, the, the wine culture, like when you, um, t- tell me some stories about what that wine culture was like, like with the original. Oh, yeah. Fireworks. That was really great because uh, we had, uh, we'd meet at the, at the uh, Tigered Fire Hall. And there maybe would be 30 of us, you know. And uh, I remember the guys who were sharing it. I remember Ponzi did that. Often Adelsheim did that. And uh, it was such a, a close group that um, it, that I, I, one of the reasons that we have this uh, truth in, in the label where it's 100% varietal, whereas California was 50% then, it's because apparently guys like Adelsheim and Ponzi and Lett went to the state and said, okay, now you know, we're going to... We'd like to, uh, and in effect, apparently, they were the same. we don't know anything about viticulture. Right. So, a, a small group of guys like Alice Erath figure out, uh, let's say it's got to be 100% bridal. Okay, great. It does, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> and but it brought California up now from 50% to 75%. Yeah. Right. And, 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 but, but I guess what I was saying, the, this, 
we, we would actually go to state of or uh, Oregon State and wondered if we could have maybe some funding or some help to, uh, to, in the industry. And in effect, they said, hey, look, un until we can't fund something that basically is six, not, a, I mean, on farming scale, that may right. or may not work. Uh, until the, this is the, the impression I got is they were told, hey, look, until it's a viable industry, uh, it's going to be difficult to get the funds. So that's why this group had to kind of figure it out on their own. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now, of course, we get a tremendous amount of help yeah. uh, from Oregon State, state of Oregon. I mean, uh, uh, and, and you know, the, the, the legislators and the governors have always been behind us, and and, and mm -hmm. so. But like, I'm I'm thinking, I'm trying to visualize like one of those meetings, and you've got like an interesting array of people. Oh right? yeah, you know, from from Adelsheim to Corey, who's like you know can be uh, pretty abrasive, apparently. Oh, let me tell you a story about Corey. So we go to these meetings. We had a rule. Okay, the meeting started at 7 o'clock. We tried to adjourn at about 7 o'clock in the evening. Yeah. Uh -huh. And tried to adjourn at about 9 o'clock, and then we could start drinking wine. Okay. After the meeting. After the meeting. And I can remember uh, uh, Ponzi uh, uh, chairing the meeting. And then, and then uh, Corey's walking around <laughs> 730. <laughs> You know, drinking the wine and, and, and telling uh, telling uh, Ponzi, like, you know, what to cover and all this. Or like, he, <laughs> the president pro tem and he wasn't even elected. You know what I mean. And, uh, in fact, uh, that another point, uh, but, uh, but I like I like Chuck Corey. Yeah. I really did. But, it, but I, I, it was, yeah, when you mentioned contention. Yeah, he, but, but, you know, there are a lot of, they have a lot of characters in, in this industry. And some people, you know, criticize certain people. But on the other hand, everybody look at some race of characters. They all contributed something to the industry. Chuck Corey was really bright mm -hmm. in that instead of using heat units as they do in California, he came up with the idea of light units. Did you ever hear of light units? No. Okay. What's he figured out that that because of our latitude, and, and like it, the sun is out, it gets dark at about 9.30 here. Whereas in, in Southern in California, there might be a two hours earlier uh, that sun sets. So therefore, we actually have, because the sun comes up earlier, we actually have more, more sunshine than, than they do. So therefore, maybe, a light unit should be factored into this. Huh. I don't think anybody has really, really explored mm -mm. that. Mm -mm. But it just made so much sense to me. Yeah. At least have a resist ripening of the grapes. Not the most important the, part. But to get back to this <coughs> Corey story, one time uh, Chuck Corey was at the bottom of, of uh, Powell Hill Road. And I saw these two guys. And the reason I would always have to go down there, because when I planted that vineyard, People would come up and they began stealing my grapes, oh, my no. plants. <laughs> stealing the plants. The plants. The plants. Wow. They pulled the plants out of the ground. Because they wanted to start their own little... No, I, I don't know what, what they, they, they wanted to... Maybe a historic... I don't know what it was. So I went down to check this out. And it's Chuck Corey. And I... And he's I, stealing your plants? No, no, no. Oh, okay. He had brought somebody else and they were observing. Uh -huh. He had brought... Because Corey had a, had a nursery or something at that time. Uh -huh. In fact, Dick and... and Dick and Chuck were... Dick I, Ponzi. No, Dick Erath and uh, Chuck they were. Corey were partners. Right. In a, in a nursery. And so the three of us are standing there. And I, I, I said, I pointed to, to my first vineyard, Pinwar. I said, that is the first virus-free vineyard in Oregon. Because Dick Erath told me that. Right. Okay. And, I, and he said, no, he said it isn't. <laughs> he, he, and... He said, that's not virus fair, something like that. I said, hey, Dick Erath told me that. He said, well, Dick Erath is full of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're partners. They're partners. <laughs> oh, but apparently not for very long. <laughs> uh, so, anyhow, I, I don't know whether it's virus free or not. Corey's not here to defend himself, so I, I can't... We'll go on Dick's it. word. But, anyhow. But, but, yeah, these meetings... That, but, so, then, that, after... Nine o'clock, of course, we'd have a nice social hour, and and uh, but there was that everybody knew everybody else, and there was that just great. Uh, 
And 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 as, and then also the thing about it is these guys who like the Adel Slimes and the Ponds, Soko Blasters, all these people. Uh, in addition to you know being quick learners in terms of agriculture, they were good at basically management. Uh, um, they could, in terms of of organization, getting the group together. Uh, and then going down to the, to this legislature and, mm -hmm. and get getting help. So it wasn't a matter that they were just going to start farming and then you know make some wine. They actually got involved at the state level, mm -hmm. and and that's why we had so so these talented guys uh, who without them without the Alzheimer's and the Letts and the Ponzi e and I hope I don't miss but you know right. these are the guys. They, they just, uh, we, we were blessed with the fact that uh, they didn't have agricultural knowledge, but they sure as had, had the rest of the package. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So th that was basically it. But, so then, um, yeah, so that's, that's how it all uh, kind of evolved. And, uh, and even when, even that taste, the Red Barn taste here, uh -huh. when, when did you open that? In 19... Uh, 1990. 88. Well, yeah, it was yeah, full board. But 88, right. like that. But there weren't many taste rooms. In fact, there were only probably, well, very few taste rooms. Just up as Erath. Yeah. It's an Erath then. But here's what happened. Uh, remodeled that red bar. Okay. Uh -huh. So it was an existing building. Oh, yeah. It's a barn. But it was uh -huh. a working bar. Uh -huh. So what we did is, so, so we, uh, <clears throat> we had a uh, kind of a warehouse that had been kind of a shop area. Okay, we made that our warehouse. And then uh, we had we, we made the other part uh, the tasting room, and then we took the, we had two horse stalls back there. We made restrooms out of those. Okay, <laughs> you've been in the barn. And, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. So here's what happened though. And then we we had a, we had our opening inventory. We had about 200 cases of wine, to, you know, and Riesling and Chardonnay back there. We didn't advertise. Very few people were coming up the hill, and uh, we opened the doors at 11 o'clock. Okay. Uh, three hours later, nobody walked in. <laughs> <laughs> and this was mom and dad just running it. Oh. Uh, now, wait a minute. Now, what made you decide, like, you're making your own wine then? No, no. I oh. never was a winemaker. Oh, okay. We always had the wines made for us by others. Oh, okay. And I, I had a deal which was the one-third, two-thirds, where I'd take, say, nine tons of grapes over to Erath or... Actually, Fred was the major... Uh, Fred, Who yeah, made Fred, it? Fred yeah. Arterberry. Say nine husband. tons... And then he would keep nine, six tons for his own use. Three tons would, would they'd make custom make the wines for us and put my label on it. Wow! The little red barn. It was so I, I figured out that's a it's a it was a good deal for them. It was a good deal for me. Yeah. It was a one third, two thirds. So uh, then they didn't have to have vineyards. I'm providing the grapes, and then we decided that uh, that we would uh, get into the retail phase of it instead uh -huh. of selling to distributors and restaurants. This type of thing. But so, so three hours, nobody came in. So Lowy and I are standing there, and we said, uh, hmm, what do we do now? <laughs> I think she said, well, we could kiss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <a> good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so what happened is, then the door opened. And it's like, I remember I, one time I was talking to a lawyer friend. He said, you know, I opened my office in Oregon City. He later became a very famous uh, lawyer in uh, Oregon. And he said, I waited to hear footsteps coming <laughs> down the hallway. <laughs> so, yeah, so this guy walked in. You know, oh, no, no, before the guy walked in, I said, you know, boy, it's just not going to work. But I said, look at it this way. The warehouse, two bedrooms. Okay, we got the, the horse stalls now that we got bathrooms. We got two bathrooms. We had, fortunately had that plumbed. We had, it's a kitchen area. We had a nice right. living area. Hey, this will make a good rental. Okay. <laughs> What are we going to do about the wine? Well, <laughs> That's not a problem. Who's <laughs> uh, <laughs> concerned with that one? What to do is better than having a whole bunch of prunes back here. <laughs> oh, man. So, anyhow, the first guy walked in. He said, wow, this is good stuff. I'll take a case. The lawyer, really nonchalant about it. <laughs> We were about ready to pass out. <laughs> uh, and we had this crummy label, this little red barred label, which I had designed. Just a picture. 
red label, red and black. The <laughs> silhouette of the barn. <laughs> it's actually pretty cool. And I had guys who, who later, the, the next couple of days later, the guy came in and said, God, he said, I like your wines, but that label. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be ashamed to, to pour that for my boss. He was an attorney. Right. I said, oh, just palm the bottle, the label, <laughs> pour it to him, he's going to wipe the wine, and then he won't care about the label. <laughs> or put it in a brown paper you know, sack. The lady standing next to the guy said, look, I've been in about six tasting rooms, and that's the best wine, and, and who cares about the label? <laughs> and I said, yeah, we're not in any grocery stores. You, you come here and taste it. And it's what the barn. <laughs> so anyhow, so that's how... <laughs> How, how much did you charge for the first bottle? Oh God, ten bucks a bottle for beer. ten. Ten dollars. Ten bucks a bottle. Uh-huh. And yeah, what? what maybe eight. Uh, and the Riesling started, was like five. We had five bucks for the Riesling. Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, so, now, now what year was that now? Eighty-eight. In eighty-eight. Yeah. And then maybe ten bucks. Well, we weren't think, getting much for the grapes then. Yeah, I think like seven fifty for the Chardonnay. This is what five hundred bucks for 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 uh, Riesling, mm-hmm. if that. Mm-hmm. Oh, the Riesling the Chardonnay, yeah. and, and that's why the guys had to leave a lot of fruit on, right? Because to cover the cost, and that's why there was some of that Riesling wasn't very good; it was kind of thin. But I didn't know, we, and I think we got ten bucks, fifteen. Them guaranteed fifteen bucks. Got twenty bucks. We were good. like, that's unreal. Yeah, that I mean, for you could get any bottle of Pinot for about fifteen bucks. Yeah. But that's how, and because uh, the only yeah. other tasting rooms up on the hill was. Knuts and Erath at the very top, it wasn't, you know, we didn't have Lang, Tori Moore, or anyone. There was no one else around. So people were coming. Knuts and Erath, because um, I was in the tasting room with Kina from the very beginning, and that was the very destination for everyone. And then they come over, and there's a marsh, red barn, vineyard, you know, the tasting room and all. Yeah. So it was like two. Yeah, now, now go down to the red barn. Mom and Dad are down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my job. The are better down there. <laughs> Just as friendly. Oh, that is funny. <laughs> yeah, so I was working up there and sending them down there. <laughs> and my really? husband's wines are at the Red Barn, so. There's another funny story that uh, how Cal Knudsen got involved uh-huh. in this whole thing. Well, he came up my driveway. And uh, what year would that have been? I don't know, the 90s? Oh, no, no, that had to be in the 70s. I mean the 70s. Yeah, like 72, probably. Uh, later than that. Because he stopped at the Lindsay place right. and, and wondered whose vineyards these were. Right there. Because yeah. Dickie Rath had not planted his vineyards yet. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So we had. So you were the only vineyard out here. Right here on yeah, the, we're the only Road. Vineyard here. Wow. And uh, so uh, Luke, she sent him up because uh, she sent him up to uh, my house, and he came in uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, I, and then he introduced himself that he worked. He was interested in wine grapes, mm-hmm. and that he worked for. Is McMillan? No, he, I didn't know he worked for. Yeah. But uh, he appeared to be somebody who uh, could really help us, you know. In uh, terms of well, probably not. He had a, a, a lot of interest in viticulture, and uh, probably just maybe he had the means to. He was interested in buying land up here. That was it. Uh-huh. He was interested in buying land up here. Yeah. So uh, there was a big parcel that where well that he bought eventually he bought that place uh-huh. and uh, so I thought oh man you know this, this we need him so I said I'd like to introduce you to Cal Canuta somebody looked that Dickie. and said that they had met previously somewhere introduce him to Dickie Rath Dickie, is what you meant. Dickie yeah. Rath, yeah so I I took uh, I called Keena I said where's Dick she said he's uh, out of his vineyard and, on Chehala um, Mountain. Shake I said, well, I've got a gentleman here who's really interested. And he wants to buy some land up here, and you know, uh, so we want to help encourage these people. So I took him over, and Dickie Rath, you know, was out there in his old sweaty T-shirt. <laughs> with him, and what he would do is to keep the deer off. He would take his sweaty T-shirt off and put it on an end post, and that keep the deer off. <laughs> Saved on laundry costs yeah. too. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, let it in the rain. So then, uh, what happened is. Uh, then Cal came back in the next week or something, and I said, no, uh, there's that 500-acre parcel for sale. And we walked up to the top of the hill, and we looked at that, and that was an abandoned walnut orchard, okay? Wow. Mm-hmm. And so the trees were still there. Yeah, yeah. a lot of the trees were and still there. And a little there. white house. And, uh, and, but it was, it, and it, it was about 500 acres, and it, and it, it was a 
not a, it was a reasonable price, 500 bucks an acre. Yeah, 400 or five, yeah. I don't know, it's something like that. And uh, so, and it had some, yep, yeah, some forest on it, you know. Uh -huh. So I said, you know, Cal, uh, here's the thing, I don't think you're gonna, there's any risk involved in this deal. Uh, number one, I think viticulture is gonna work okay. Uh, number two, uh, if uh, that doesn't work, um, you know, it, it's view property. It, and, and if agriculture is going to work up here, you know, that's view property. And number three, it's got timber, you know. So you, you, he said, look, he said, that's not timber. I thought, what does this guy know? He's from Seattle, you know, this type of thing. So as he left, he gave me his card. C. Calvert Knudsen, Senior Vice President, we're also <laughs> And before then, it was Macmillan Blodell of Canada. Oh, so. oh, that's, how, that's, how. that's timber to us. But, and then O'Cal was also one of the, it's, it's so instrumental because he was, yeah, he was an attorney, but he was a right. great business manager. He later became CEO of Mac, Mac, Macmillan Blodell in huh. Canada, which was the largest. Uh, industrial company there. So here you had somebody who was interested in viticulture, somebody who had the resources, and somebody who had had the skills, management, business, know-how, and having, having him in the industry yeah. was very important too. So these are the little things that began coming into the industry once we got something going here. Okay. Yeah. Cause, but yeah, because Cal was, started one of the. That's one of the biggest vineyards at that time. Oh yeah. Because I started pruning that in '77, so they had to be about four years old then. So it could have been about '73. It started planting. Yeah. So that's how that. Then they formed a partnership, and then uh, that's Cal and Dick. All uh -huh. But no, essentially, yeah, that's the situation. Okay. Tell me a little bit about like that's the wine culture at the beginning. Tell me about wine culture right now in Oregon, from the hill here. Um, you know, actually, one thing, now that I'm almost 82 years old, <laughs> I've kind of uh, backed off the whole thing. I, I'm taking less and less. I, I mean, I, I don't belong to any organizations. I don't do, I, I really don't get together with with the other these people other than to occasionally at some party or something like that yeah. so in terms of <clears throat> uh, I, I i don't you're gonna have to ask somebody else about that because i just don't uh i have really i'm, I'm just happy now farming my little acreage i continue to get on the tractor every day and uh and, and i i i, I know, dropped out of the politics of the whole thing and, 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 and I just felt that, hey, once we got these other people involved, because I used to really be active in agriculture, uh -huh. in, in the cherry uh, growers, the co-ops, uh, and, and fruit co-ops, and then nut co-ops and stuff like that. And I just felt, hey, look, guys like me, we should just, just like a horse going back to the barn. <laughs> but anyhow, and, and the beauty of it is there, there's, there's so much talent to just come in here and take over and, and, and you know, even the direction that it's taking, um, you know, I, I think, I think I, this whole, I think there will be a, of the original group that will continue, like, with Jimmy and with mm -hmm. the, with the Leps and with the Ponzi's Ponzi. mm -hmm. and, and the Soko Blossers, that that will never go away. Uh, but I wonder if as some of these huge corporate companies come in here. And I'm not talking about Domain Serene and Domain Duran. I'm talking about the mass marketers, but I, I don't know how they can pull that off. But it, it, if that come, if they come in and, they, and it's more of a marketing type thing, I think we're gonna lose some of that. Mm -hmm. But well, and I and I see it actually as three generations here. And I see what, what Dad was saying with now, it's moving into the next generation and, and people of my age, such as Alan Holstein and Roland Souls, um, those people and the Langs, and so who have then taken up the next momentum. Whereas David Lett said, "Okay, he's retiring. He wants to 
play with the grandchildren and things. So now that age group is coming in and has come in 15, 20 years ago and kind of keeping the momentum going. And so we see things from one perspective, such as the next layer, Bill and Julia Wayne, and the, we have a close circle of friendship. And now it's the generation of Jimmy's, that age group of which Jimmy's one of the first, or of the first, and his body of friends, such as Jesse Lang, and those people, um, the Allison's the Blosser. That, yeah. and that culture will never change. And it's, we will, even if we're an island among the corporate giants. Right. But I don't think there will be a mass consolidation for this reason. It's unlike California, where they can have 2,000 acres spreads and this type of thing. Because we have these microclimates, because we have these small parcels, because those people, those of us who got here early, we're not going to give up our, our way of life and, and, and our, our family's going to continue this whole thing. So there, it'd be almost impossible, I think. I, I know, I know Erath, you know, sold out. And, uh, but, uh, so we'll see how, how, how that's, that works out. But I, I don't think what happened to California, it, where the liquor companies have come in and taken over and have put in their own management and this type of thing and marketing, I don't think that'll happen because all the people I talk to, their families, hey, we got the best slopes anyhow because we were here earlier and we're not going to give those up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and if one person does, there, there's not enough of the rest of us for, for any corporation to say, hey, this makes that doesn't make any sense have 20 acres here and 30 acres here. Yeah. So anyhow, it's... Uh... And so what I was leading up to on that, too, in addition to what Dad said, is that now you have... In ours, we're more active in the vineyards and in the wineries. You know, we have interconnections. In Jimmy's age group, you have Allison Sokol Blosser, Jesse Lang. You have all the... Dun it's the Dundee Hills AVA. Uh -huh. which is now going. And it's all these younger ones who are the leading people and the, the movers yeah, they, and the they're, shakers, they're, they're and they're the organizing, and they're yeah. doing the, the connections and the webpage and the legislature. They're now moving yeah. into that one. And so, and as Dad said, the, the slopes are here. There's not going to be the major people saying, I'm buying this thousand acres here. Everybody, Jimmy included, and Jesse Lang, and um, d um, let... Jason Lett, they all have pride of what their family has started and keeping it in that same arena, the same size. Yeah. So, and that's also not the Oregon culture. The Oregon culture, people live here for other reasons than just selling out to somebody for mega bucks, okay? Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, we love our beaches, we love our, you know, our mountains. We, we fought to keep this in, in, as a matter of fact, this is an interesting story too because the developers wanted to come up here uh, and subdivide all this property, okay? And that's before we had land use laws. Before in... LCDC. 73. 73 for 100. Uh, so, so what happened... To, fortunately, Yamhill County commissioners... This was... Yamhill County was agricultural based. We basically didn't have any industry out here, okay? Uh, so agriculture was, was prominent. And we... The first salvo up here came from an outfit called, I think it was called Standard Investment Company. Or Standard Insurance Company. I'm not, it's one of the two. Uh -huh. And they bought the old Allen Fruit Company, 500 acres. Which is beyond. And they were going to subdivide <coughs> that into one acre home sites. 500 homes. Or wow. Because it was grandfathered. They had a grandfathered in. Uh -huh. So what happened is uh, the they, uh, we had these meetings. A group of us got together. And that's before, that was before uh, grapes. Okay? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. So, and and so we got together and, and we fought that. And we said, what are you going to do for water? Well, we're going to pipe the water up from, you know, land and all this sort of stuff, you know. Not through my land are you going to do it, okay? Because we were in, the, in, in between. And we knew once they put a subdivision up there, this there whole thing would collapse yeah. because I can't be farming with 500 homes up there. So we had John Myers and we had Herb Holtzmeyer and, uh, and myself. Yeah, wouldn't be. Uh, and, 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 and these two families were original and they owned a lot of land. Uh -huh. And we then had 160 acres. 
So what we did is we said, you know, we're, we're at the crossroads. If, if that thing goes through, uh, we're gonna, the heart, it's gonna change for us too. So uh, we said, why don't we go to the county commissioners and uh, ask that this be uh, a zone for farm use only. Uh -huh. So we did. And so this was back in the 60s, as I recall. And as I remember, they were kind of surprised that we didn't want to basically subdivide our property, I think. The commissioners. <laughs> yeah. But, but they that's said, okay, that's what you guys want to do. So what they, what they did is they, in effect, uh, kind of saved this area up here uh, for farming before LCDC came in, which then officially locked it up in 1973. Yeah. And that's why, uh, right now, I'm the only guy who could, I was grandfathered in, I could, I could subdivide my 90 acres up here, that's what, what I have now. Nobody else could do it, because I was grandfathered in. But I, I'm not building any more, any homes, okay. I mean, I, we want to keep it just this way. but. But I think uh, it was the foresight of the Yamhill County Commissioners in the 60s to recognize that if these guys wanted to keep it in farm, we'll see that it stays in farm. Uh, because they, we just felt that at some point, that's what you would have seen. All these hills would have been covered with homes. Yeah. So, uh, but anyhow, that's how that all came about. Jimmy, I want to ask you now, you're, you're third generation. Marsha, I'm going to get to you too. Yeah, Martha, that's fine. Oh, well, um, I had so right. You're not the first one. <laughs> uh, what, you know, it's like you're hearing your granddad talk here. And what, what influence does that have on your thought process? He's like, you're starting to make wine now. Mm -hmm. You're starting to get into the industry. What, 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 you know, like when you hear your grandfather talk, what, what, what influence does that have on you? Oh, well, it's always just, uh, you know, great to soak up and listen to and hear the stories about how things came to be. Uh -huh. You can learn a lot from that. Um, you know, I uh, I just really try to soak up as much stuff as I can and hang out. And, uh, it's really inspiring. Yeah. And what, you know, it's like, what, what are you aspiring? Like, what do you want to be doing in, say, 10 years? Oh, making wine. Uh-huh. Getting bigger. I really want to what I want to do. Every year I'm trying to get bigger. Uh -huh. Make more wine and just focus on making the best pot wine I possibly can. Yeah. The best grapes I can get and make the best wine out of it. And where does that, that motive, where does that come from? Uh, well, I love Pinot Noir. I love Oregon. I love Dundee Hills where I'm from. And, uh, you know, I take a lot, a great amount of pride in the quality of my wines. And I, I feel like... Uh, I feel like I have, uh, you know, a lot of momentum going into this based on my history and the past and uh, the family. And I just want to build on to that and keep going and just keep the momentum going. So what is it about the history that you want to keep going? What, what is it specifically? Uh, just the, the tradition of, of growing grapes and making wine is something I, I like. And I just love to do it. Uh, something I just really have a great time doing. Uh -huh. And uh, I just love the craft of it. I, uh, I love um, I, specifically the Dundee Hills wines. And uh, I just want to showcase the Dundee Hills and uh, showcase the Marsh Vineyard because I believe it is one of the best <coughs> in America. What's, what's, what's different about the Marsh Vineyard and the Dundee Hills than, say, Eola or uh, uh, Roseburg? Well, with Marsh Vineyard, it's really <laughs> unique because, of number one, the vine age. Uh, uh -huh. you know, it's very rare to, to have vines that are 38 years old outside of France, you know, for talking about Pinot Noir. So immediately off the bat, that gives a great advantage over other, other fruit, other vineyards. Um, as far as the site goes, you couldn't have a better site than, you know, being at, uh, you know, 300 to 800 feet, Dundee Hills right here on this soils, and, you know, it's planted to the older clones of Pinot Noir, which I really like stylistically for making really elegant, pretty wine, which I feel is the, what the Dundee Hills does. Dundee Hills uh, fruit characteristics are really 
bright red fruits. Um, they're very elegant. They have um, nice acidity naturally from the from the microclimate that we're in. Just everything kind of lines up um, where we're at on this site to make really beautiful Pinot Noir. And um, you know, what is it about, like specifically, about like the Dundee Hills and this area here that makes makes that wine? I mean. Right. It's so, you know, you know, you look at all the variables that go into that and yeah, you can't nail that down. Um, but there are there are a lot of factors that play into it. You know, just the hills, just kind of kind of almost the rain shadow effect you have coming over this ridge right here. Marsh is right here. It's just, you know, our microclimate, where we're at, the, the, the slope of the hills, the age of the vines, the, the, the airflow that we have. We have a great airflow that comes over the top of the hill. We have wider rows, so that that allows even more airflow, and it rarely ever we rarely get any rot. Rot pressure is very low. Um, just all these things. And, that, and you're saying that's because like your the spacing between the spacing uh, the helps. A wider spacing actually gives you a better airflow, um, less rot pressure. Huh. That's interesting. Huh. If I could add, uh, Grandpa would have a have Louis Martini. I think uh, said. Uh, you find me a good fruit orchard, that's where I'll put in a good vineyard. <laughs> and that's what we had. Plus the fact that these Dundee was formed by people from Dundee, Scotland, and they were uh, orchardists back there. So when they came out to Dundee in the 1800s, they planted Dundee, decayed with all great fruit up here. Mm-hmm. In fact, Emil Sander, who owned that 30 acres, he told me as a kid, they used to have a have a co-op down there, and it was called Red Hills Fruit. Huh. And then the co-op drew from the Red Hills, and he said, but and it was very successful because everybody wanted this this great, uh, mm-hmm. and, they, and they, they dried them mostly, they didn't can them, they were all dried. And then they began to buy from other other sites on the valley floor and this type of thing. But he said, I would always, we would always go back and get the drier screens, and the Red Hills fruit was just dripping, you know, it was uh-huh. so sweet. And those are the ones they would eat, okay? Mm-hmm. And in fact, I found that old stencil. I know. Joe Harry I was going to say the Red Hills fruit. Said, Red Hills fruit. So it's not On the a, new, vit- it's, it's a yeah. new viticulture area. But in terms of, of uh, fruit growing, hey, uh, it, it, this has been here since, uh, been and successfully raising families, entire families mm-hmm. on 60 acres. And every every family would have their dryer. So they had these 60 acre parcels and, and there were dryers back in the 1800s, even when we came out. Mr. Uh, Harry's yeah, dryer was right there. We, we had, the, yeah, one dryer was down there, <coughs> dry on the side of the hill. <coughs> so there's been this thing, this has been proven to be a great fruit growing area. Yeah. So, so in fact, I was talking to Sterling yesterday, and I said, you know, uh, God, we just got a 93 from the Wine Spectator and a 92 from uh, another uh, deal on, on uh, Scott Paul and then on, on Howard's. And, and everybody crit, crit, not criticized me. Well, they say, Jim, you're old, old-fashioned. You got these 12-foot rows, 600 plants per acre, and everybody else has 2,100. And I said, you know... I get good sun exposure, I get good air drainage. You know, I'm satisfied with a 93, 92. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I get That's acceptable. Of my and everybody wants my grapes. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> when somebody else irrigates it, close plants it, and comes out with a 95, and I'd say, you're right. Okay, good for you. I'll drink your wine. Okay. <laughs> so and this whole thing about... So, so I, oh, I asked started, I said... Hey, Sterling, how come, you know, everybody wants my fruit, and, and I'm getting a 93 and a 92, and I have Lowy's Block, as a matter of fact. Wines and Spirits reviewed 470 North American Pinots. And we had a Lowy's Block, which was made by Rex Hill, uh-huh. came in number four. Wow. Four out of 475 or something in the, in the year 2003. So I said, you know, as long as... I mean, I'm going to continue to do that. And, but, but Sterling said, he said, these Red Hills, he said, 
you could have 3,000 plants, you could have 600 plants, and it doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference. These, these soils will, will, will give you a good wine regardless of whatever your spacing is. Huh. So it's, 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 uh, it's just a unique place. Yeah. And I think it's pretty well regarded as, Very well. as, as the Grand Cru. At least, maybe I'm... <laughs> I don't think so, Dad. I agree with you. And, well, the other thing is, and I know, I know that there's always some scoffing on this, but because we have the prunes and cherries that covered these hills, and many of these vineyards are planted in those old existing orchards, I really do think because you have cherry trees that have been in there sixty some years, and the prune trees that were in there for fifty some years. You, you can't tell me that the roots, the flavor, the essence of those prune and cherry trees doesn't go down into the soil and no, permeate it and flavor the soil somewhat that even though you pull them out, there's still some of that in the soil way down deep because those roots are not just 10 feet deep, these cherries especially, that there has to be something there. So when they describe oh. the pinots that we have up here as you know, characteristics of prune or plum or cherry flavors and blackberries. Well, that's that's what's here still on the farm. We still yeah. have those There's things. one other factor, too, and I think I have, we have the last remaining uh, uh, vinifera on its own roots. Everything you see out there is still on its own roots. And um, uh, I have yet to plant a grafted rootstock. Okay. What, what's your thought about it? You know, uh, is uh, not it, but anyhow, and that's fine. But I'll continue to do it. I had a flock to prop in a Pinot Gris. Is there lived on top of the hill? Uh -huh. I have uh, two and a half acres up there, and he spotted it. And there were about six or eight plants beginning to fail. He said, Jim, that's about 15 years old. He said, You've got phylloxera, it's going to wipe out that vineyard. You're going to have to. You know, pull that, but he said, "Be okay if I brought somebody from from OSU up and and or a consultant, and, and let's stay down to see if uh, if we can find them." Well, they dug and dug and dug the first day, and they couldn't find it. But then the second day, they came back and they found some phylloxera. And he said, "Yeah, that's it." I had at least that 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 vineyard out because I was trying to retire and this type of uh -huh. thing. And they made a, I think, a big mistake everybody made, and I never made that mistake. I, I tried to talk people out of it. They put it into sod, 100% sod. And they wanted to stress their vines because then you produce better wine. Uh -huh. Well, Timmy would know more about that than I. I never like to stress a vine because it's like stressing a body. You get sick, you die, and this stuff is stuff. So, anyhow, at least I took it back and I, mean, I tore it all up. Got a big old cover crop disc in there. I think I even ripped it out. She cultivation. One of my centers into that. <laughs> but anyhow, so uh, so I, I began farming it the way I would farm my cherries and my hazelnuts and my walnuts and my prunes, where I developed nice mulch in the summertime mm -hmm. and and maintain the moisture because soils are capable of holding a lot of moisture. They are back into not only the ones that did. I right now you can walk through that vineyard. Mm -hmm. You can't find a sick plant. Huh. So I attribute it to the fact that, forget this whole thing about competition and stressing your plants. You may make, in fact, you know, I think there's some validity to that because when you notice that a, that a berry plant or something is dying, it begins to produce its nature's way of producing the best fruit and seed Just so that it, the species will continue, see? So anyhow, so that's... Uh, and right now, I, I have a lot of phylloxia. I just took that vineyard back. I'm working on that. And other than that, on all my vineyards... Right. It's clean. Uh, you can come here in the summertime, and they're all famous. And there's, I don't have any other spots of phylloxia. Mm -mm. So and you attribute that to... Clean like, cultivation. That, that clean cultivation, no, no sod, maintaining vigor, no herbicides, because most everybody's gone organic now, anyhow. And just keeping the plants healthy and vigorous, and you may sacrifice a little bit of quality, maybe, uh, in terms of, uh, you don't, I mean, you know, you have to be a little bit careful in terms of uh, too much vigor, but then, you know, if, if you go in there and do a lot of hedging, you know, keep, to keep the, the leaf stuff under control. Uh, but you, you got to keep that plant healthy. At least that's my strategy. Yeah. I'm sure that 
a lot of people would refute that, but that doesn't really bother me. Well, it speaks for itself. Yeah, the thing speaks for itself. Yeah. If it works great, if nothing happened, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Martha, you tell me a little bit what it was like to kind of grow up with, uh, you know, uh, like the, in, grow the up in the, in the vineyard. <laughs> yeah, with Zoe, it was so important to her too. So the two of us always need yeah. to be mentioned. Yeah. Because we're not, in fact, thinking you were at uh, that book that the boys up north. Uh, he gave me a, a signed copy and he said to Jim and Lloyd without you two this probably would not have happened mm-hmm. so it was great what was it it was a bit of a transition and not even a, an awareness yet when we started putting in the vineyard which is right below there because we were, you know, it's a family effort too in some ways um, because we had the prunes, we had the cherries, we had the filberts, we had the walnuts, so we were all, all the kids we were all used to working anyway on the farm after school, weekends, Christmas vacations, school vacations. And so you're doing chores, you're doing... All the time oh, anyway. Yeah, farm kids. Yeah, yeah, there was nothing that was changing. It's now a new kind of crop that's going in and what's this one all about? Um, that started in 1970. That was the vineyard down there. I started... so. What my job was, that vineyard started, and then by the Red Barn, the Vadensville, was to water in the summer with a tanker truck and just standing beside and doing that. Or when Ted got the hose system around the Red Barn, the series of pipes and hoses. (laughs) So we didn't have to tank water, but we were just watering one one time. Yeah, that's what just for the very first year. So you knew that that was the one year you were going to stand outside and water and hoe around these little things. So that was the first beginning of it. Um, Then was college, and yet I lived on the farm for the first three years of college and commuted to Portland State, so was always helping out on the summers or whatever needed. Mom was still working full-time reading, and Dad had, you had not yet retired. Um, what, when it got more interesting was right after college, the year after college, and it was a very rainy, that's when I realized, this is good. Um, it was a very rainy harvest. It was in 1976. This is the fall of 77 then, where mom and dad, you guys couldn't get pickers for that one lower block. We just had no pickers, so I called my my previous friends from college about a crew of about six people, and it was definitely the United Nations kind of group. I had a, a friend from Palestine, another friend, a you know, fiery red-haired <coughs> Patrick from the East Coast, and I had Craig and um, Ruth from New York City, all these odd, eccentric friends who we all knew each other through Portland State and said, we need help picking, can you help pick? Oh, that sounds like fun, that sounds like fun. I said, Mom and Dad, we'll have tacos at the very end. And so um, they all came out. We had rain gear for those who didn't have enough. And we picked the Riesling. It was a Riesling that needed to be picked. And we picked the Riesling. We had to take the boxes, carry them up to Warden Hill Road. And there was a truck and Dad and Ted and all. And then afterwards, having tacos at mom and dad's and this diverse group, Louise, she was Italian. I mean, you have all my friends here. And it was just the best feeling. It was just great. And knowing then, okay, this this works. And then um, I went on then, graduated, of course, from college, and then moved back that after that one year. Okay, I'm back. Thank you very much. Um, and his mom said, well, no one can ever take your college degree away because they paid for, they covered all their college degrees. And I always thought, well, now, who's they? Who's trying to take my college degree away? <laughs> but mom was just glad. Okay, she got, but she's back. Then I started, um, one of the things I did right then was starting to work up at um, Knutza and Erath. Uh-huh. And I would be pruning and working in their vineyard, which were just babies' vineyards then. And then... That was when Keena and Dick opened up the first tasting room up here, and they asked me if I would help them run the tasting room. And at that time, what was the winery in the garage of the E. Roth house, that was where Dick and Keena lived, now became the tasting room. Uh-huh. And that was when Keena and I, every Saturday and Sunday morning, I'd walk up there from living up here and walk up there, and we'd just open up the garage door, our tasting room, and go, well, I wonder if anyone's coming by. And we'd have maybe three cars, and they go, we didn't know there's a winery here, because then it was a little building. And that was how, that was the very first tasting room, probably even in Dundee, because David Ludd had his in McMinnville. And just people learning about the wine and a, a couple wine appreciation classes up there. And it just, I just never stopped doing it. And then... Um, 
In fact, that was where I met Fred. My husband was up there because he was pruning too, and he was making wine with David Lett and getting uh. his winery going because he was a UC Davis grad in enology, and he was working with David Lett and pruning up there for money and um, working on getting his own winery, Artiberry Winery, um, going, he, the winemaker, adjacent to David Lett's building. So it just kept kept going. There was a small circle, and we all have similar um, interests uh-huh. and, and attractions. Yeah. I'm, so. I'm going to need to take off in about 10 minutes. I need to go up to the winery. Okay. okay. You know, you talked about uh, your group. Of, this is another thing that Can we almost had minutes? trouble because we couldn't get ahead. We didn't have a labor pool. No Hispanics. Yeah. So we had to rely upon, like, your situation, getting friends out. We had to get people on Social Security who then would come out or unemployment or something like that. And and it was a... One year was the Vietnamese, no, the Cambodian people. Oh, yeah, the Cam- uh, and the Vietnamese. Right, yeah. 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 You know, this is just a side story, but you'd be interested in this. I had a, I was the first one to employ Vietnamese, the people, the boat uh-huh. people who... Uh-huh. who uh, who, uh, and they, they came to, to Portland and they formed the Vietnamese Cultural Center. So s- somebody contacted me because these people needed work. And I yeah. said, sure, I can use about 20, 25, something like that, 30 maybe. And they said, great, we'll have them out there. Okay. So, and these were all legal people because they went to, came to the United States, they were given Social Security numbers, right. and had all these long names and this type of thing. And, uh, and think, I noticed about that. They would share the work. So the next day, I'd have a completely different crew. <laughs> Just because they need to <clears> share <throat> the money. But, but yeah. Yeah. Not, a, not the tragedy, but the, when you think of the, you relate it to what happened to Vietnam and how that poor nation collapsed. I was down, so, uh, two, two gentlemen came up to me and said, may we pick a little longer? I said, well, do you have transportation back to Portland? And he said, yes, we drove. So I went down to check on them, see if they needed anything, give them some water. And, and I noticed this, this one guy's hands were just beautiful. And I said, you know, what did you do in Vietnam? You said I was a surgeon. Wow. These are very wow. professional people from there who were The who other fled. gentleman said I was a professor. Yeah. Made me sad. But they only pick for a year or two because now they're off oh, yeah. and they're doing things. They're practicing. They're, they've now, they had to come and, and do something to survive. Yeah. 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 Well. No, but that's, yeah. So, so that's how that started. And then it just, you know, then with Fred and then, you know, Mary, Fred and I married and we lived up there. And then, you know, Jimmy was born and, and here we are, generation three. Yeah. You know what I'd like to do if, if Jimmy's got to take off? I want to take some photographs of the three of you, you know, together. Okay, go ahead and state your name. Uh, Jim Marsh. Okay. Also Jimmy Marsh. And what, um, what title should I give you? Title? Susan. Yeah. Um, what, is, what, what is my title of what? Uh, just what, what should, you know, it's like, like uh, have your name. What, what else should um, I put there? You could say owner and winemaker of Arterbury Marsh. Okay. Um, and the question I wanted to ask you is like, you know, it's like you've, you come from an interesting perspective, like as a third generation person, like having grown up in the vineyard. What has the vineyard taught you about life? Um, you know, I don't necessarily um, relate the vineyard to anything like that. When I'm out walking around the vineyard, I'm looking at um, it as a vineyard, as a way to make wine, uh, ways I can make it better, what I have to do, what are some things I could change. You know, um, the vineyard, I've always been up on here and I've had, it's given me lots of time to think. Uh, it's a beautiful space, it's a good place to take a walk. Um, you know, being out there in the vineyard, doing work. Uh, your mind just goes wild, it just always runs. Wild in terms of well, you know the thing is, that if, for example, if if uh, if I go out in the vineyard to work and I have some things on my mind, 
that are bothering me or something uh-huh. like that, that might get amplified when I'm out working in the vineyard, you know, something like that. Uh, it's just, uh, what has it taught me about life? Well, you know, I think that it's more about the people around the vineyard that have taught me more about life than the vineyard. The vineyard is just uh, something that I'm fascinated with and always trying to learn more about and uh, trying to uh, figure out ways to make even better wine. What have the people taught you that are in the vineyard? Well, everything. Like? Like, like what specifically? You know, I, that's how I've become who I am is from the people who are around me. Uh-huh. And you, like, um, just because I haven't, I used to pick grapes. It's like, you're talking like pickers and, um, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of just kind of curious. It's like, what kind of lessons? Um, I'm like, talking about more of my family. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the vineyard is a lot of work and um, that's what it is. Uh-huh. A lot of work in in terms of physical work, going out there, getting the job done. There's a lot of steps, you know, to to uh, bring some grapes that are clean and ripe. And it's not uh, it's not easy. It's a lot of work, but you know, it's just like anything else. You know, if I was a if I was a mechanic, I'd look at cars and I'd say, you know, it's, it's a lot of work right there. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm in I'm in the wine. So what does a what does a winemaker um, bring to the bottle? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot because the winemaker has the responsibility of taking grapes and turning them into a finished product that they can stand behind. And so, therefore, the winemaker needs to be involved in the vineyard as well because they're going to be sharing some responsibility with the grower for the final product. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, the, right now the Dijon clones are really, really favorable. People love the Dijon clones. And they're planted very commonly throughout the hills. Um, I don't like the Dijon clones as much as I like the older clones, uh, the Pomar and Vainsville clones. But the thing about the Dijon clones is they ripen earlier. And it's, it's a safer bet almost with this Oregon climate because you can ripen grapes before they get rained on. Yeah. I see a lot of you know, vineyard managers really like the Dijon clones simply for that reason, that convenience. But now me, on the other hand, I'm thinking about more than just delivering finished grapes to a winery that's clean and ripe. I'm looking for, for the flavors, and I'm looking for balance, and I'm looking for a lot of other things. And so, therefore, I would prefer the Pomar and the Vadensville over the Dijon clones. So, you know, it's just uh, bringing, having a winemaker involved in the vineyard is just going to bring about a uh, different perspective on, on the whole thing, what they're looking for. Kind of balancing it out... Um between what the what some vineyard managers might want, um, the interests of, of uh, yeah, the yeah. interests of the grower and the interests of the winemaker yeah. can be slightly different sometimes. Yeah, and it seems like then there's personalities that are involved too. Like let's say that you have a grower that you know is dead set on you know it's like you know I want to get my fruit in like now because it's going to rain tomorrow, sure. um, and then you know like the winemaker. Um, has to, says, well, wait a minute. Let's, let's. We're not quite there yet. You know. That's definitely an issue. Yeah. Huh. That must be. Do you have like any stories that that kind of revolve around that? Or. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I've. I usually try to try to push for going a little deeper, but. Um, I don't really have any specific stories. And then I'll allow him to say, he <laughs> separates from us. <laughs> and it was a little challenging in harvest. The, this year especially? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. this year. Yeah. Yeah, so Jim and I were always a, doing that. It can be a tug of war. Jim and I are every morning looking at the extended weather forecast, what's going on, what we're picking, when are we going to pick it, what's going to happen, what is his need, what's our need. So <laughs> we had no family meltdowns, thank God. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy, thank you very much. I appreciate it. For sure. Yeah. See you later, yeah. Sweetie. Thanks a lot. I still have uh, Martha and, and uh, yeah. Jimmy. Don't, don't run away. I no, no, no. I'll sit by Dad. All right. Okay. See you, everybody. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And we will. When Dad comes up, the three of us go up to Tori Morrison. Okay, that's Dad can that'd barrel be, sample. Yeah, that would be really cool. I, I got another per- winery coming up. You don't, you no, don't not today. Me. Not today. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm talking down the line. Oh yeah, down the like line. Like a couple. Yeah. Of- okay. No, no, no.
if somebody's going to call me, see if I'm available. No, or, Jim wants to take you up there anyway and barrel sample. Yeah, some other time. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's what we said. Yeah. I want to ask both of you because, like, both of you come from really different perspectives. Like, like Jim, you kind of almost like stumbled in that yeah. had, with a lot of bravery into the vineyard business. You know, and now that you look back on that, like thirty, what seven years or so, what has the you know what has the vineyard taught you? Actually, I don't. I I I can't say that I treat my vineyards any better than my cherry orchards, my walnut orchards, my hazelnut orchards. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So. You know, I think any success we've had is the fact that uh, we had a, a, a successful farming operation with hazelnuts. Uh, uh, we were mechanized. So I, I, I don't have that burning desire to be the greatest <laughs> viticulturist. As a matter of fact, it's funny when you mentioned about titles. I, I tell people, I'm a farmer, okay? Uh-huh. And people say, I go back to the Midwest now and then, and, and I have a lot of people who have dairy farms, and they you know they grow corn and stuff like that. We get together, and they'd be sitting at a table, and uh, I said, I'll sit down at this table with these farm. I said, hey, I love to be among farmers because I'm a farmer in Oregon. And they said, well, oh, no, we understand you have wine grapes. And, <laughs> and I said, hey, I, I'm not a viticulturist. I, don't even, I can't even spell it. I, I'm a farmer, okay? And, and they're, they're really aghast at the fact that, that somehow people think that if, if you're a farmer, it's a it, it's it's a bad name. You know what I mean? It doesn't have... Well, it doesn't, really? it, well, it doesn't have the... The like pizzazz. Yeah, uh, well, well actually, I'm uh, a uh, viticulturalist, you know what I mean. Uh-huh. And, but, but when I, well, I love, I love my forest as much as I love my vineyards, uh-huh. okay. Uh, we'll never cut a tree. In fact, we, we planted, uh, uh, there are very few ponderosa pine forests in the Willamette Valley. But people yeah. didn't realize that that the Willamette Valley was once native to ponderosa pine. But you have to get the, the cones, the seed. It's very site specific. We cannot take a, a seed from Bend and Sisters. It won't grow here. Yeah. Huh. Lloyd and I decided we were we had a slope, a north slope, and we had and we decided to put that into again something new. We have the, the first ponderosa pine uh, forest, it's beautiful. The you trees know, are it's, forty it's right feet. Right behind my place on the seaward, seaward. Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes, yeah. 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 Loy and I, she would come home uh, from uh, chemo. She was taking chemo, mm. and and she would, but never got sick. She would we would plant this this tree, and we laid out that whole thing, and now these things are forty feet high. My neighbor said, Jimmy said. Uh, you know, there's no market for ponderosa pine. There aren't any mills. I said, hey, it's not my problem. That's my grandkids' problem. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted another forest, okay? Uh-huh. And it's growing. So, so, and then I love my cherries, and I, I like my hazelnuts, and I and like my walnuts. And I'm, I mean, I've got slopes that, that have walnuts on it and cherries, and they make a wonderful vineyard. But I walk through the forest, and I'm as excited about watching the spring we go down I got a couple springs and the trilliums come out and and I probably get as more excited about walking through my forest than I threw my, my vineyard actually uh-huh. yeah well, the but uh, is the work ahead of you <laughs> but it's it's just uh yeah it, that's my philosophy I, I just I'm just glad we were able to number one preserve this for others to enjoy okay uh-huh. And for people to come out into the wine country, come into the tasting rooms, and they say, God, you're really lucky. I said, you know, I know I'm lucky. Every morning I get up, and I just marvel at this view, okay? Uh-huh. And, but I said, I, well, I get so much satisfaction out of being able to share it with people like you. Uh-huh. And maybe you're living in an apartment somewhere or a crowded townhouse or something like that, and come on out to, to the farm and... I, and I tell people, hey, you can walk anywhere. 
you don't have to run up and down Warden Hill Road. If you want to jog along the thing, go through our vineyards and go through the orchards and this type of thing. And just sharing it with everybody because yeah. it's we're just we're just custodians for a brief time mm-hmm. and then and then it'll still go on. Yeah. So it people say I, I don't give a darn about a legacy, but if there's anything I'd be proud of, it would be the fact that we preserved these hills for for viticulture, for farming, for forest, and and that will and then we and then uh I say we, I, I take the government. And I want to mention another thing about Lloyd. She probably had better communication with with plants in the vineyard than anybody else. We would go out pruning together. And I would hear her talking. I'm about 20 feet away, and I could hear her talking. I guess somebody's in the vineyard. Nobody's there. She's talking to the plant. Uh-huh. She's saying, now look, your neighbor there, doing really well. <laughs> And you are, you're just not, and she's kind of scolding that plant. I listen to the chatter. And, and you know, they, they talk about some people walk in a room and there's a plant, and, and sometimes it begins to wilt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, here comes the i got to shake up, you know what I mean. So, and that was the beauty to it. The two of us spending all those hours together, and then the kids helping, and it was just a great, and then also, the employees. I mean, Mario, Asidra. I legalized all these people to this day. Their family, as a matter of fact, what's that celebration they have when they're 15 years old? Quince and I, and, uh-huh. and I've been, uh, I, what, the, the grand, whatever I'm it is. I've been the godfather. The, I've been the godfather. So, so one time, <laughs> this little kid, this little Hispanic kid, um, said, uh, ran up to me, said, Mr. Marsh, Mr. Marsh, uh, would you like to be the godfather for Esmeralda's uh, celebration over in Woodburn with like 300 people. I said, hey, I would be honored. What do I have to do? He said, you got to pay for the band. <laughs> <laughs> I walked in. Here's this like 40-piece Mexican <laughs> band and the guys have these white uniforms with gold plated and the brass <laughs> and I'm saying, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so I've been, the, I've been the god for two of them, and all the, and, 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 I, and Louis and I were the only uh, Caucasians there, uh-huh. and all these other people looking at, how come, you know, I've been the best man for, for the guys that work for me, <laughs> oh, me. and that, that that's that's the joy you get out of farming. It's, it's yeah. not just pr- producing, trying to produce really good Pinot. It's about. And we pay people well, well above the minimum wage. We take care of them. Lori would, oh, God, we were picking cherries. We had these cherry orchards. We had to hand pick all these things. Lori w- would prepare a coffee break. She was dainty. She would make all these rolls. Yes, four in the morning. Mom Get and I would th- be up doing that. Wow. And, and then she'd you. drive up there. She'd honk on the horn. Everybody would come down off their ladders. And, 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 and I mean, after the harvest... People would send us flowers, mm-hmm. but any anyway, one time so, they, there was a the there was a little blind girl, and and uh, she would uh, they would take her up because we had a, had our own labor camp. We had showers and bathtubs and laundry facilities. It was we, ah. and we it was they were they're all family. These people would do anything for us. But yeah, so what happened is this little blind girl, and they were picking for about ten days up there, and at nine o'clock. We'll, Lloyd would always go up there and honk the horn every come down the ladder. So at about 8 o'clock, I heard the horn honking. So I said, what's going on? Everybody came down off the ladder, so I went up there. Everybody came down off the ladder. This little blind girl was honking the horn because then she knew that she'd be getting... I was like, where's, where's Louie? And the little blind girl there just honking the horn. <laughs> but these are little vignettes that, I mean... Oh, you talk about a, oh, Louis kept a diary because we have a son, uh, David, retired as a Navy captain, and the Annapolis graduate, and got out of the Navy, and and she would write to him once a week. So his whole Navy career, she would tell him exactly what was happening on wow. this farm so from the time he entered the Naval Academy in 1970 until he retired about five years ago. So wow, and then. David's wife saved those letters. Oh, 
So we can wow. put those together, and it, it would make a tremendous oh, book. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah, anyhow. It's a journal of its own sort. Yeah. But anyhow, the, and also the yes. fact that, you know, we had Ted and Ferd, and 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 uh, I've got one son, uh, Joey, and he would watch my two guys who grew up in Iowa, dirt poor, very little education. Uh, Ferd lived on top of the trailer. He wasn't, he was uh, mentally challenged, would you say? No, no. He, he, he was he was very education. shy, yeah. and he Not was almost a there. recluse. He was just cutting wood for somebody. Uh -huh. So he he was Ted's brother, our main guy. So I said, hey, I got a job for Ferd, and we'll buy a trailer for him, and he can uh, work for me. And 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 the guy we we turned him so that I'm I'm prouder of our achievements in that field than I am you know the pain and war that grades ninety two or ninety three or whatever, but or makes people happy. But we took him from a recluse, and uh, and we put him on Social Security, and I, I and I said, Ferd, you can go into any any business in Newburgh, and I made arrangements. I said, when Ferd comes in, you treat him with respect. He can charge anything at all, and he was he became he was really important. And the guys could fix anything. We we. We was we were the first to use chicken manure in the vineyards, okay? Ah. And we had a contract with a with a hundred thousand bird farm to collect all their chicken manure and that alone is a fun some funny stories that happened. It was a consistency of ready mixed concrete, okay? And, and, and yeah, and we had to pick we had a I bought a dump truck and and they would fill that up right right up and it looked like ready mixed concrete and my guys would drive it six days a week I had to drive it one day okay on Saturday because that was their, their their church day so anyhow um, but one time I burned out the clutch on a Saturday which was their church day in in an orchard and and I had to get there the next day so the guys couldn't work on it until sunset on Saturday night uh-huh Sunday morning, I had to figure out a way to get that manure. Ted, just from knowledge, did no manual, just wrote down what he needed to replace a cut clutch in a dump truck. Parked, stalled in my orchard. Wow. I went to Napa. I got all the stuff. So the sun went down. Fern here, out there. Turned dark, flashlights. The next morning at 5 a.m., he honked the horn. They replaced a clutch on a truck in an orchard. <laughs> These were my guys. Our guys, we, we, they made our own harvesting equipment. Huh. Amazing. So my son Joey watched them. And, and, uh, and, and so he, he knew how to weld. And this. Then he went on to Oregon State, got a degree in mechanical engineering. Uh-huh. And then he went to work for a manufacturing company as their engineer and, and actually invented the uh, Z chain. Z tire, tire chain. They, they manufactured tire chains. Wow. It became this. And, and then um, he, he was living with us and he, he came to Loy and me one day, night and said, You know, Dad, uh, Mom, I've got an idea. I need a thousand bucks to file a patent. And uh, we so we gave him a thousand bucks. I remember he went to bed and I said, you know, we'll never see that. <laughs> Joe did say he'd pay you ten. Oh, years. oh yeah, yeah, many fold. Yeah. Actually, make a long story short, he has seventy patents set on exercise equipment alone. He invented the elliptical exercise. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But wow. I tell the story about growing up on a farm, okay, and watching. I mean, and he made part of my grape pole, and I'm the only one in the world who has a grape pole like that. And then you got the parts from Rex Sobs, you know what I mean? And and I, I tell people, I said, you know, this nation is going to be, once we turn to corporate farming, we're going to lose this, these Hands guys in, in World War II, when, uh, when the Americans invaded uh, France, June, and the tanks hit these hedgerows, they couldn't get through. Some farm kid from Iowa or North Dakota figured out a way to weld 
something to put in front of the tanks to break through the hedgerows. Ah. And it was this type of thing. I tell people, I said, you know, it's a hands-on. we talk about the wonderful pro- uh, uh, commodities that we provide the nation. But I said, one of the things that will be missing someday will be this farm kid like Joey who will have become a mechanical engineer but never really worked on a farm and this type of thing Mm -hmm. so I guess when when we talk too many people when they when they get involved in the wine scene they just focus in on just wine and grapes and I'm saying we had the 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 pleasure uh, and privilege of focusing in on the whole operation, and uh, so that's uh, that's what I will take out of this whole experience is these many great memories, and I mean, uh, if I don't come out with a dime, I could care less because I've been enriched in so many other ways, uh, other than monetarily. So that's essentially. What about my you? life. <laughs> it reminds me of my, my six-year-old daughter, Anna. And she said, pardon me? I said granddaughter. Granddaughter, yeah. Granddaughter, yeah. yeah. You're a granddaughter. And uh, she gave me this thing she had written for her class. It's like, My Life by Anna. <laughs> She's like six years old, you know. It was about eight sentences. Like, that's all I can remember, you know. <laughs> Whereas I can sit down and, oh, man have a fire in my fireplace, turn my jazz on, crack open a bottle of Pinot, and I just say, oh, and then look out at my view, and I'm saying, life is good. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, that's... What about you, Martha? Um, Well, there's a title I always say, I'm I'm a farmer's daughter. And that includes both mom and dad. Yeah. Uh The farmer's daughter. Um, It is, again, it's not just the vineyard, but it's the farm. Uh-huh. And I've been on the farm again, except for nine months of my last year of college. But I love the diversity of the farm, to have the walnuts there with that whole scene going with the crows that perch in it, and the woods that are here, and the woods that are down below, and the vineyards, of course. The vineyards are something that attract the people, but once they're here, they see the other quality of the farm and the beauty of the farm. Uh-huh. And that's what I love about the retreat. And the cover that it provides for the you know beneficial insects and wildlife and stuff and that's why with the retreat what i like is it gives people an opportunity to stay here and also i tell them you can wander all the way through there's trails through here i map out trails for people so it's sharing the farm that's the Uh most important thing because many people who come out here and you can see in the guest book they don't have the opportunity to be so nearby to something and to be immersed in the farm and what takes place on it and the filberts well these are the filberts there's the wall yeah so um and I also like the tradition. I like carrying on the tradition. Mom and Dad taught me some things, and Mom, of course, was always cooking food. I was working with her with the cherries also at 4 in the morning, turning out those Danish pastries and this, and all. But now when we have our people, who Mario and Isidra and their family, who are helping us in the vineyards that we take care of, I'm always out there. I'm making enchiladas for them and all. And they know they don't even bring their food because it's carrying on with that tradition. Yeah. This is what you don't think is expected. This is just how, how it should be. This yeah. is what we do. Yeah. And so it's no different from that. But I think that's why the quality of the product is so good because... It, the people, we people care. Puts, you know, we care about all these things. Yeah. We care. And, and one of the things, too, and I've always felt this is where to live, is because I love, you know, my home, and I wake up every day, thank you, God. This yeah. is so lovely. And, and going through the vineyards and going through the woods. And, and um, one of the real important things was when Fred and I knew we were pregnant with Jimmy, um, he didn't know it was a boy, but I did. I didn't want to surprise him. I'm spoil his surprise. I I did want him named James Joseph David because that's uh-huh. after Dad and my brothers, and I thought that was so important to me to carry that on because I'm named after my grandmother and I think a great grandmother. All the people in the family, and that is important to me to carry that on. And Jimmy is James Joseph David Arterberry. And then when Fred had died, I had his last name legally changed to Marsh, also, uh-huh. which is mine. Uh-huh. So that's why he's James Joseph David Arterbury Marsh. Uh-huh. You can't get okay. any bigger than that. <laughs> 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 the guys are not 
you need a back oh. label for that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it's one of those labels that kind of falls out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, but, but that's important to me. It's tradition. It's family. It's farm. It's all of that. So that's that's, and I don't think it's not the teaching lesson is over. It keeps expanding and magnifying with every season and. Uh-huh. And, and as Dad said, you know, and Jimmy, I know, Jimmy sees the vineyard as far as work because he sees, okay, this and this. Because ever since he's been very little, he's worked in the vineyard and helped Mom and Dad on certain blocks and then um, helping me hoe certain blocks and everything. And now when he used to not like it, now he's out there and telling me what I should be doing with some of these vineyard blocks. Uh-huh. So it's kind of taking on, on an interesting role now the two of us have together. Wow, that is interesting, but, isn't it? But it's good. But it's good because he actually is very... Very good at what he's suggesting with certain vineyards because one, he's going to get the majority of those grapes, and then secondly, he's also out there with us doing the same thing. So it's like, okay, if you want it done this way, then let's work together on this. Yeah. So much like mom and dad spending time together, Jimmy and I are out in the vineyards, and my husband joins us too when he can on weekends and all. In addition to Mario and Isidro, working again now with their children and grandchildren, helping us out in the vineyards too. Uh huh. So it's all very very familial uh-huh. is what that is and yeah. that's important yeah that's, that's what makes it worthwhile you know so because I've worked for e before and I've worked there and that's fine but now it's good and it feels so good to do it for your own for our helping Jimmy get his grapes to make the wine and to carry on with the marsh and so yeah that's why yeah it's a very good feeling I bet that is it's like a real family kind of a that the connection continues yeah yeah. And this is a very important place for that because people sense that. But I was just thinking the difference between the Ponzi's and the Letts and the other families. Because I always t- tell people, I say, look, I'm not a winemaker. I'm a farmer. I just grow this stuff. And a lot of these other families had like Dick Ponzi and you know the, the whole works and this type of thing. Whereas Jimmy was more involved in the actual farming part of the operation and then uh, and took the up winemaking, but he didn't have a mentor like the other ones had. With a winemaker. Yeah. Right. So when you talk about the huh. third generation, and, and I was thinking about that because having worked for a major corporation and also being a naval officer and then a you know, farmer... Um, when you start with a major corporation, they give you a small department to manage, okay? Uh-huh. And then if you do okay, then you punch that ticket. They give you more people to manage, and you go up, and eventually and you come become the boss. And you, instead of district, it's a region, it's back in New York or something like that. Uh, in the Navy, when I was commissioned, I was an ensign, okay? You go in there and you say, you know what? A commander, I think maybe it should. We should be doing it a little differently, you know. Well, hey, well, in effect, he's telling me, "Look, you punch your ticket, okay? There's all these little tickets you have to punch. You've got one little stripe there, okay? If you punch the right tickets, and remember, I don't know a hell of a lot more about navigation than you do as a commander, okay? Then you can you can do that, but you need a mentor, and." Uh, it, but but you need to go through these steps, uh-huh. and a lot of times it's it's a lot easier for for like uh, the lanes and this type of thing because they they got not only got involved in viticulture, mm-hmm. but also then we're on the probably running around in a winery a lot too. Oh, right. What I mean, so that's why I, I I would caution Jimmy to be patient, you know. Because he's come along really fast in terms of working for different wineries and this type of thing. So, uh, and he's done really well with it, with his wine. Uh, but you know, it's almost like he started back here, and then and then he will achieve the, the same. But but I you know and and sometimes whether it's Dick Ponzi or 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 Dave Lett. I mean, these guys are legends, and and Dick Erath, and, and 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 maybe some of the third tier will become even better than their. I mean, I could have somebody who's going to be a better farmer than I am. Okay, uh-huh. and that's fine. 
but, but it's, it's, it's all a long process. Well, and Jimmy is going through this process, and he is going slowly, but he, because he's been making wine for three years now, and see, in his case, Fred Arterberry was one of the best winemakers in Oregon, my husband, and Jim has worked with Mark Vlasic, who learned from Fred. Mark took him under his wing. He learned from Lynn Penner Ash, who yeah, made Yeah, but all I'm saying Rest is Hill. this is for and one now, crush. Right. See what no, I mean? No, now he's doing that. This is actually now his fourth crush. That I know, but, but there was one crush in. with each person. See right, what I mean? Dad, Instead of being hanging around the tanks all the time, uh -huh. like, like my kids <laughs> hang around the vineyards. Yeah. Well, Jim does actually... He does full-time work in the winery, and he has. His full-time job was at the bistro and also at the yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm talking about Tarimor. the past couple of years. Right, and Jim is, and he's learning, and he is on a very... He is a brilliant young man, and he has many of Fred's ways, who is absorbing this, and Fred was a natural, and Jimmy is becoming a natural, too, and his wines are identical to Fred's, too. Oh, and I'm very... And people have taken him under their wing, Don Olson, and said, Jim, you can make your wine up here. You are succeeding. I want to see you continue to succeed. So it's almost, so he's been in the vineyard. He has been in the wineries. He's worked even volunteering in the wineries, and it's good to see him because he has the balance of both, the vineyards and the winery. And he's But see, a lot of people don't have that experience. That, that Jimmy and, had in yeah. the farming part of right. it. Because the, the farmers, the, the winemakers will say, hey, 85% of it is what happens in the vineyard. And that's exactly true. Yeah. Right, and Jim knows that. So that, I think that contributes to Jim's success, too, is the fact that he knows what's going on oh, out definitely. there. Oh, definitely. He lives there. And he has yeah. a feeling yeah. for it. Yeah, exactly. feeling for Every it. Every morning when, it, when you wake up. I mean, he's on the farm, too. He lives on the farm, too. So it's, and together we're both talking on this, and he sees what Dad's doing, too, and knows why Dad's doing it, and defends what Dad's doing in the wide rows, as you heard him say. Uh -huh. That's great, even though there's other, oh, it's so small spacing. No, this is the way to do it. This is what works best for us. Right. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's interesting to see now the third, you know, third level. Well, and it's in, you know like you have an interesting situation here. It's like you've got a farmer, farmer's daughter, a kid that you know grew up I, on. The I farm. juggled both ends of it: mm -hmm. the vineyard and the winery section. Uh huh. And I had when Fred and I got married, I helped him. Oh, okay, his okay. So there, okay. So I was involved with the Arterberry Winery on that too, and the vineyard side of it. Yeah. So I've seen both of it, and when Jimmy's doing something, I can caution him. Well, this is what. And eventually, we'll, we'll get his father's winery journals because he should have those to read too. Uh huh. So, yeah, yeah, it's a combination of them. Yeah, yeah. I gotta look at my thing here and see if there's anything I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of additions to what you do. Uh, yeah. Know. <laughs> That's why I'm glad it's recorded because then, yeah, then yeah. it's accurate. Yeah. Oh, I, you couldn't get these notes down. There's no way. There's no way. And plus, like, for me, it's a joy to watch people. It's like I'm learning probably more by watching yeah, you're right. than I am by you know listening, and it it's like yeah. Number one, I don't I don't do interviews anymore. But if I did, I would insist that Tape. it be recorded. Right. Yeah. And videos is kind of like self conscious time. I don't like videos. Oh, here's here's another question that um, you know, and we touched on it just a little bit, and this is actually for both of you, is. You know, it's like you grew up at the the beginning of the wine culture here, and uh, you know that's like thirty some you know years. Thirty eight years ago. Thirty eight yeah. years, and when you look at other wine cultures around the world, like say Burgundy and you know the French and the Italian, and mm -hmm. I mean uh, we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Oregon wine culture will last? Will last? Yes. I tell a little funny story about that thing. Uh, one time I I had, uh, well, I know when we tasted that barrel tasting up at the main drawing. And I think, oh yeah, and, and, and so I wrote a little note to, uh, who's it, Jacques, or what, what is it? Do, up there. Oh. The owner. Robert. Uh, Robert. Robert, Robert, yeah. Oh, Robert or something. And I said, you know, I tasted your wines. They're phenomenal. Uh, I said, we've been in the business for uh, you mentioned you know, hundreds of years. We've been at you've been we've been in the business for twenty years. 
you've been in it for probably 200 years. Yeah. We are, they were phenomenal because I, th but we're about 180 years behind. <laughs> 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 and so I, I tipped my hat to him. I said, you know, okay, I appreciate the fact that you people have been doing it for 200 years. We're not there yet. Yeah. We don't claim to be there yet. Yeah. But I think someday we'll catch up. But right now, we're 180 years behind. <laughs> but there's, you know, there's a certain thing about, like, their culture. I mean, their, their tradition is so steeped. Here... It's like we've got a couple of cultures going on. We've got the Oregon culture um, with all the stuff, you know, Measure 37, um, you know, all mm -hmm. that Oregon independence, all that kind of stuff. We have the American culture. There's a lot of corporations. You know, we've got all that kind of thought <coughs> process that is quite a bit different than the French. And that's why I wonder if, in fact, the Oregon wine industry will, in fact, last that extra 180 years. You know why I think it will? Because the French, as we all know, are very secretive. And I understand that they have these family secrets mm -hmm. about making wine that uh -huh. have stayed within the family for that long time. Oregonians were different in that wine scene. Everybody shares From information. The very Everybody. If you if you got a better way to ferment, cold soak, all these new things, hey, we all share it, you know? And, and, and whether or growing the grapes or whatever, that that information is funneled into uh, the commons. Uh -huh. So I think that gives additional strength to the Oregon wine industry huh. is the fact that it's almost like a brain trust that you have. It's collaboration. And, and we draw from from so many peep sources, whereas France, I think, and honest to God, I've never been to Burgundy, so I can't be, uh -huh. but, but what I've but read and heard secrecy. is the fact that, hey, we're, we're not, we, we don't share these things. But anyway, I think, uh, I think it'll, I mean, hey, uh, because of the good land use laws, that, that, that key, now without good land use laws, this, this would be gone. They'd probably do in great big grapes on the valley floor or somewhere like that, but uh, you know. But anyways, so I, I really think that um, as long as you you have this great product, uh -huh. I mean, the, uh, people will come. I mean, they will buy it. So, uh, uh, and if we don't pull it off, well, then maybe somebody else will be able to pull it off. But the point is, it, the, these slopes, these Oregon climate, we can produce a, a, the product. So uh, the product will always be there. Yeah, yeah. And the demand is growing too, especially as the urban area of Portland gets larger and larger. More and more people are seeking to come out here and appreciate what is out here and to protect what is out here. Uh -huh. And that's and that's one reason why this whole Dundee Hills, this area up here, is so popular. Also, is because it's very close to that metropolitan area. The people have the funds to purchase these pinots and to also come out and enjoy and appreciate what is only an hour's way from where they live. Yeah. So that makes this region even more visually popular. Yeah. Because you get that many times when people say, I can't believe this is above 99W. I never knew this existed up here. And it's only two miles up. Because it is. Probably the very first time you came up here and saw the hills and all, you were probably surprised at the number of vineyards and what you saw. And then you've watched it also grow. Yeah. Yeah, but I, you know, I think we're really tied in too with the Washington wine scene. For this reason, we can't do the Cavs, we can't do the Merlots, we can't do the Zinfandels. Well, down south they do. I mean, yeah, yeah southern south, Oregon, yeah, yeah. Pacific yeah. Northwest. But I yeah. think a region. But I, I really, I really think that the Great Northwest it's almost like a regional area. And that's mm. what it is. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Pacific mm -hmm. Northwest. And, and um, so that gives us additional strength too. In fact, that's one of the reasons that. Uh, Michel. San Michel bought, bought uh, Erath is because they didn't have in their portfolio the uh, a, a Pinot because yeah. they can't grow that stuff out there. Yeah. So, I mean, we get a lot of support that way, too. So, well, and, and many of the wineries here in Yamhill County even bring in grapes from eastern Washington and are making the Syrahs yeah. yep. and the yeah. Cabs from Tory Moore to Peter Ross back to Carlton Wine Studio to all those people. So it's meshing Washington grapes under Oregon 
brands. But regardless of, of the individuals involved, individuals I, you know, will come and go. But as long as uh, these soils produce mm-hmm. this wonderful product, somebody's going to be farming. And they're only yeah. getting better. The grapes are only getting better. Because? They're getting older. They're the seeded. vines are getting older. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that's what Jimmy was speaking about, the old roots, the old vines. This is one of the reasons why marsh is so important, because they are one of the oldest vineyards in Oregon, fifth oldest in Oregon. And those vines are bringing in the characteristics of the soil. It's not just the first five years. It's just See, that's my objection to irrigation. In fact, in Burgundy, I understand it's illegal to irrigate. But we, any, irrigate. we dry farm. So so the, the roots then will actually go down in, in it for the moisture. And then the wines become more complex. Sometimes if you irrigate, the roots will have a tendency to come up. Yeah. The water. Yeah. So we'll see how that works out. But uh, anyhow, in fact, Jimmy on his uh, label puts non-irrigated, non-irrigated uh, vines. Yeah. Uh huh. So yeah, yeah. Because it's becoming quite where people go. Oh, good. <laughs> I, uh-huh. I talked to Sterling about that yesterday, and he said, "Well, the only thing is, because I said, why do why do people need to irrigate? Well, there may be a few years where if you give them a shot of water." Uh, they might ripen a little earlier or something like that. And they don't that, dry you know, out. Whatever. We haven't yeah. had a problem, though. Yeah, not if you manage the soils. Yeah, that's that's interesting because, like, I hear that uh, actually quite a bit. Like, they're, you know, people are putting in irrigation. Yeah. For the first year or so, like, they, they'll irrigate yeah. to get those plants going. Yeah. And then they say it's insurance, like, on a really dry year that... Yeah. Um, you know, it's like you don't get raisins. But I agree with Dad. But yeah. that's never happened to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, yeah. Because it's yeah. plain cultivated and there yeah. isn't yeah. that moisture stress. Yeah. yeah. And they're they're lovely. Yeah. So you'll have to keep coming back at harvest time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll walk out through with that one again. All right. That sounds good.